It's Thursday, June 23rd. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, the Supreme Court handed down a major ruling to expand gun rights, and while it dealt with the New York concealed carry law, it's actually bound to change gun laws in Maryland. WTOP's Kate Ryan explains. It certainly seems that gun laws are in for a change in Maryland. I also talked to a gun violence expert at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health about what this ruling means for the safety of our communities. Sadly, there is a correlation with more gun carrying. You generally have more gun violence. And Bethesda native Katie Ledecky is swimming at the World Championship in Budapest, Hungary, and she keeps on winning. Megan and I talked to USA Today sports columnist Christine Brennan about Ledecky and the 50th anniversary of Title IX. It's a very big day, a day for Americans to celebrate a law that we have fallen in love with. Thanks for joining us. I'm Luke Garrett. Megan is out today. The Supreme Court ruled Americans can carry concealed guns in public during a year plagued with rampant gun violence in the D.C. area and mass killings in the country. The ruling strikes down a centuries-old law in New York that requires a special need for concealed carry permits. Maryland has a similar proper cause law that's now vulnerable, and it could fall. WTOP's Kate Ryan is here to explain this to us. So, Kate, what is this Maryland law exactly, and how likely is it to change? Okay, in Maryland, if you want a concealed carry permit, you have to provide a legal reason to carry the firearm. It's kind of like you have to go to the state and say, mother, may I, and here's why I need to Mm. have this firearm. Right. Um, Then you also have to prove you don't have a, quote, propensity for violence, uh, something that would make you a danger to yourself or others um, in order to get the concealed carry. This was seen when enacted as a safeguard. Right. You know, everyone talks uh, about keeping firearms out of the people who have no business having them. Mm. This was seen by proponents then as a great safeguard, but it was also argued that this is an absolute violation of people's constitutional rights. And it's exactly the argument that we saw put forth to the Supreme Court and the one they ruled on. Right, right. And so with the Supreme Court, you know, basically putting the nail in the coffin of this Maryland law, what are state officials saying and reacting? Well, and, and here's the thing. I'm not a legal scholar and I don't play one on TV. And even uh, legal experts like Brian Frosch, the attorney general of Maryland, said he is going to have to analyze this and see what the impact will be. Mm. But almost universally, Maryland is a very blue state. uh, And there's a lot of criticism of this. Maryland Attorney General Brian Frosch, again, here blasted the ruling. He said it will make places, public places, more dangerous He called it, uh, you know, we're already awash in gun violence, Mm. uh, so exacerbating the situation. Senator Chris Van Hollen from Maryland called the ruling a slap in the face and said literally more Americans will die as a result. Maryland's lawmakers, the top lawmakers, Senate President Bill Ferguson and House Speaker Adrian Jones also criticized the ruling, saying they fundamentally disagree with it. They'll review the opinion and, quote, if necessary, pass legislation that would comply with the Supreme Court's ruling, but would also protect Marylanders. I don't know what it would take to do that, I, I but that's where they stand. Mm. Now, I should say on the other side of the issue, the NRA, the national organization, called this a watershed win um, for the Second Amendment and Second Amendment rights. Maryland shall issue a pro-Second Amendment group said it would review the ruling and its implications and comment when appropriate. Another look at this comes from a Maryland state delegate, Leslie Lopez, who was very instrumental in passing laws that restrict ghost guns in Maryland. And she called this, and this is a quote from her, shameful at a time when the vast majority of Americans are asking for simple, common sense gun reforms, SCOTUS, quote, spits in their face. Wow. So this is, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of of condemnation that this decision has been met with in very blue Maryland. It's going to be interesting to see when we get a precise ruling on, okay, what has to happen next. But it certainly seems that uh, gun laws are in for a change in Maryland. Kate Ryan, thank you for coming on the show and telling us the ripple effects of this Supreme Court ruling. Anytime. Let's now take a look at the research on gun violence prevention to see what impact this Supreme Court ruling will have on New York and likely Maryland. 
For this, we turn to the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy, Professor Daniel Webster. Professor, thanks for being here. Good to be with you. So you are one of the leading experts on gun violence prevention in the country, and you previously led Baltimore's Homicide Review Commission. So tell us, what impact will this Supreme Court ruling that makes it easier to conceal carry a gun, what impact will that have on gun violence in our communities? Well, sadly, there is a correlation with more gun carrying. You generally have more gun violence. The general idea behind uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court ruling and the general set of policies to deregulate civilian gun, gun carrying is that the more so-called good guys or good gals who are carrying guns, it will make us safer from the from the bad guys. I, I wish the world was that simple. It simply uh, is not so simple of being able to uh, always know who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. One thing that we've seen is that even though people with licenses to carry generally as a group are low risk, there's still smaller subgroups that do have backgrounds of concern and do sometimes get, you know, do violent things with guns. But the other important thing is we've seen a pretty substantial increase in theft of guns from motor vehicles following uh, easing of restrictions on civil, civilian carrying simply because uh, more people on a regular basis are taking guns out of their home and they often leave them in their motor vehicles and thieves know this. And mm. the, some of the cities that have uh, seen the easing of concealed carry have seen doubling and tripling of guns stolen from cars. So those guns go immediately into the hands of people you probably don't want them to, <laughs> to have guns. Mm. So with this 100-year, century-old rule being struck down in New York, more people will have guns in their hands in New York, concealed, and that will, research-wise, lead to more violence. Am I getting that right? That's correct. That's what we anticipate based upon uh, research that's been to date. But it's important to note, of course, that what we've studied to date are laws changing in places that don't have populations nearly as dense as New York City, for example. So the implications for New York City could be m much more severe than what we've seen in other you know, states when we, when we look at these uh, changes in laws. Right. And so, you know, this ruling dealt with the New York law, but there are many other laws, notably in Maryland, which have similar kind of proper cause laws. So do you expect these to fail and how will this impact Maryland and, you know, Baltimore, big city specifically? So Maryland law will not immediately change, but it will eventually have to change with this ruling. Uh, uh, under current law, the uh, state police issuing these permits can use discretion in issuing the permits about whether uh, someone has a good cause to to carry a firearm. And the state, the, the state legislature is going to have to make some adaptations in the law. And the Maryland State Police will have to make some adaptations in how they're issuing permits. So we, we clearly will expect that soon, I don't know exactly how soon, but right. relatively soon, you're going to see more permits issued for concealed carry in the state of Maryland. Mm. And just hours after the Supreme Court made this ruling, the Senate took a key step closer to passing new gun legislation. In a 65 to 34 vote, 15 Republicans maintained their support for the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, joining 50 Democrats. What's in this bill and will it prevent gun violence? So there's a lot of things in this bill. So, um, so I'll try to cover these points pretty quickly. For one thing, there is um, $750 million uh, available for states to use to, to either to uh, implement what some refer to as red flag laws. We call them extreme risk protection order laws. But the states could also apply for these money for other types of interventions with similar intent. And uh, some of the examples used were uh, mental health courts or drug courts. So that's one key provision. Another key provision is a somewhat expansion of domestic violence uh, prohibitors under federal law. Very specifically, it extends to dating partners. Any misdemeanor battery charge or assault charge can lead to 
a five-year prohibition for being able to purchase or possess a firearm. So that's a significant measure that we think will translate into uh, less violence and more lives saved through these laws. And, you know, this year, the country and, you know, D.C. region as well has seen a lot of gun violence and just mass killings, to be to be frank. We're seeing Supreme Court rule. We're seeing the Congress act. How would you characterize this time in American history as far as, you know, gun regulation, gun safety goes? It's very noteworthy that we finally have Congress acting on this. It's, it's encouraging. There are some good things in this bill that we should be uh, happy about, but we also should not be satisfied. We have a very divided country, and so different states re- respond with different policies. Some see these acts and say, this is, uh, this is crazy how easy we make assault weapons or other guns available. We need to have stronger laws. Other states see the same problem and they say, okay, we're going to train teachers to uh, have guns in schools like what Ohio did. So this is repeating a, a pattern that we've seen in prior years as well of tragedy happens, policymakers feel some pressure to act. When they do act, they, they act on different understandings of the problem and what will solve it. Professor Danny Webster, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And after the break, Megan and I get an update on a Bethesda native who happens to be one of the best swimmers in the world. Katie Ledecky is swimming at the World Championships, and she just keeps winning. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like the podcast, head to our show page, give us a rating and leave a review. We read all of them and use the suggestions to improve the show that we're so proud of. It also helps other listeners find this, our region's only local daily news podcast. Thanks for making us a part of your day. This past weekend, Bethesda native and international swimming powerhouse Katie Ledecky claimed gold in the world champions in the women's 400 meters in Budapest. She's an athlete who we normally only hear about around the Olympics, but with a showing like this making international headlines, we thought we'd bring in USA Today sports columnist Christine Brennan to tell us what this record means for the upcoming games in Paris and actually for the rest of the world championships going on now. Christine, thanks for being here on Zoom with us. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. So Katie Ledecky has now won three gold medals at Worlds. Tell us about um, how she's done so far. You know, Megan, she is having an incredible performance at Worlds. She's 25 years old. Uh, That's not young for a swimmer. It's young for life, of course. And she's getting better. She's getting faster. And um, what she did yesterday when she uh, helped the U.S. women to the 4 by 200 freestyle uh, relay gold medal, which was unexpected, a surprise. Um, She actually became the most decorated female swimmer in history at the world championships with uh, 21 medals overall. She's just extraordinary. Mm. Three golds already, one more event to come Friday, tomorrow. uh, One of her specialties, the 800 freestyle. This is almost almost unbelievable that she continues to be so dominant at an age when many women have long since retired. Right. I mean, how uncommon is this? And what's her trick to just being so prominent and successful? You know, it certainly is. uh, It's uncommon for a distance swimmer. And that's what Katie is. You know, Katie's doing this over the longest distances that women swim or anyone swims. The 400, the 800, the 1500. 1500 is the mile. Imagine swimming a mile, (laughs) you know, for any of us. I mean, Katie does that. (laughs) No, 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 Megan, we're, you're, no, we're not doing that, but, but, but Katie is, and she loves it. How is she doing this? First of all, she loves to train. She fights through the pain and enjoys the challenge of training. And that, that can be tough. And swimmers talk about that because your head's in the water, you're looking at the bottom of the pool and you're going back and forth and back and forth. That challenge of that, the chase, so to speak, is what makes Katie Ledecky 
is so, so different and so fantastic. Uh, she loves that. She loves trying to better herself in practice. And she hasn't gotten tired of that, even though her first gold medal was 10 years ago at the, at the London Olympics. And wow. so she is, she is an extraordinary person. I mean, super smart, lovely, kind, gracious, just what you'd hope she'd be. And she's an extraordinary athlete who continues to want to push herself. I had the opportunity to interview her once and she was so humble. And I just kept trying to get out of her. I was like, this is a big deal. <laughs> You're an Olympian. And she was like, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just a lot of hard work. But it was so um, almost like validating as one of her fans, you know, to see her just really take it in stride. I wanted to check up with where she is now because she graduated from Stanford. Um, and she, you mentioned the training, but she's changed up her training a little bit, training with men. Can you tell us kind of where she is and how she's training? Absolutely. It, this is a very significant uh, story. And I actually think it's the best story going into the Paris Olympics, which are two years away. Hard to believe they're already two years away. I know. Uh, two years, uh, the 2024 games in Paris. Um, she, after being at Stanford and you're right, she graduated. In fact, she got her degree because of the pandemic, she focused on that to not push it, you know, put it off, but to get it done then, which got a brilliant, smart move by her. So she got the degree. And while she had a great time at Stanford, she realized that really no one was pushing her. There were no great distance swimmers there. So what does she do? She moves to Florida, University of Florida, Gainesville, and she is training with all men. And the best male distance swimmers on the planet Bobby Fink, who won the 800 and 1500 in the men's mm -hmm. in Tokyo last year, mm -hmm. and uh, other swimmers uh, that have been at the Olympics or at the Worlds right now. And she's pushing them and they're pushing her. And one of them said occasionally she beats them. And but what she's thriving on at this point is that challenge because obviously the men are faster than the women at this elite level. Katie's the greatest of all time, uh, but men swimming, the times are faster. So how brilliant, what does the greatest swimmer on earth do to challenge herself as she gets ready for another Olympic games from the ages of 25 to 27? Uh, she goes and swims against men uh, to try to push herself and get better. It's, wow. it's a mm. fascinating story. And Christine, within the pantheon of world champion swimmers, where does Katie Ledecky really fit? Is Michael Phelps kind of synonymous? Where does she really lie? You know, I think she's right there. I mean, Phelps obviously is Phelps and he's retired now, but he's got so many medals, the Olympics and swam so many different uh, events. And of course, the, the longevity he had as well. But I think Katie's number one among women. And I would put her probably right there with Phelps. Uh, you know, Michael Phelps clearly is, would probably still still get that headline. But, um, you know, for me, covering the Olympics, so fortunate to do, as I have all these years, you know, to see someone like Katie, who was just an absolutely exemplary role model, um, and, you know, never, never anything out of the ordinary, just fantastic leadership skills. Mm -hmm. You know, if your, your boy or girl is cheering for someone, cheer for Katie Ledecky. She will never let you down, Megan, as you were referring to. And... Um, and so out of the pool and in the pool, uh, I think just absolutely the best. And Christine's humble about this, but she's covered 20 Olympic Games. So she kind of knows what she's talking about here when it comes to <laughs> comparing Olympians. Um, and, and this is a big day. Speaking of your experience, this is a big day um, in the U.S. for women's sports, because today is the anniversary of Title IX. Um, and tell us about that. You've recently written a column about it. Exactly. Yeah. The 50th anniversary of Title IX. This is a really big deal. Uh, signed by Richard Nixon, June 23rd, 1972, changing the playing fields of America. I mean, back then, girls were really not encouraged to love or play sports. And now when you think about it, the other 50 percent of our population, women, are playing sports, learning how to win at a young age, learning how to lose, which is probably even more important. Yep. Teamwork, sportsmanship, obviously physical fitness, all those things. And now there are millions and millions of women, probably even you, Megan, who, uh, and certainly me, who have played sports and have gone uh, with those life skills, those life lessons, uh, and have gone on to, to great things. And that's just the beginning. Today's 10-year-old when she gets that full blast of Title IX, what is she going to be like in 50 years? I think women will be running for president throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s onward in this country, if not the rest of the 20s. And I think the common denominator for all those women running for president, running companies, running universities will be that they played sports because of Title IX. So it's a very big day, a day for Americans to celebrate a law that we have fallen in love with. 
Well, it's very inspiring. And thank you for breaking it down for us as far as where Katie Ledecky is so we can keep an eye on her heading into Paris in just under two years, right? That's correct. Yeah, she's got one more race at the Worlds on Friday and then and then full steam ahead to another World Championships next year and then the big one, the Paris Olympics. And I wouldn't be surprised if she doesn't also try to go for the Los Angeles Olympics in 2028. Oh wow. He has not ruled that out. And uh, she is one of a kind. And I, I would say that right now I would expect her to be there in some form as a competitor. You heard it here first, folks. Katie Lecky <laughs> may be in L.A. for the Olympics. USA Today sports columnist Christine Brennan, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. And before we go, I have a little bit of a challenge for listeners out there. So recently, I've been playing with a little tune that starts and ends this show. It's kind of like the WTOP sounder. It's do 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 Anyway, that song is so stuck in my head, understandably, as, you know, Megan and I edit these shows every day. And so I hear that song probably... I don't know, 20 times a day. And I play guitar, so I've been trying to figure out the exact notes of that little tune. But I don't want to look it up. I want to I want to just figure it out and really dial it in. So if you are a musician, listen to the very end of this show. Right after I say, have a good night, everyone, or see you tomorrow, there'll be a little sound signature. Try to find each of those six notes and let me know what you come up with. I have like two options right now that I've kind of written out and charted out. But I'm really curious to see if we can if we can dial it in and find, and find what that little rift is. And that does it for us today. Thanks for joining us for the DMV Download. We're sponsored by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And follow us on social media, where we're posting content every day from the show and behind the scenes. You can find out more about this podcast and become one of our VIP listeners at dmvdownload.com. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at WTOP.com, and on the WTOP News app. See you tomorrow.